Okay, we're back, page 1052, states of matter. Uh, states of matter hazardous material, uncontrolled release from a container can create many problems. Uh, materials, physical and chemical properties, how it uh, behaves, determines the harm it can cause, and influence the effect it may have on all it can uh, contacts, including people, living organisms, other chemicals, and environment. Uh, influence how a container will behave if damaged or ruptured. So, first responders need to know how to collect hazard and response data that provide information about the substance, physical, and chemical properties. Proper resources can greatly assist in the responder in determining the presence of hazards, estimating potential harm, predicting how the incident may progress. So we do need to know this. Matter is found in three states. You need to know this. It's gas, liquids, and solids. Try to identify the material's physical state as early as possible. A gaseous or liquid and solid hazardous, hazards uh, material behave differently. Behavior influences the material's potential hazards. So what you need to know on that is that a gas, a liquid, solid will behave differently. So make sure you know that. Once you understand how matter behaves in each state, you can better predict where the hazardous material is going, what exposures it may affect, and what those effects may be. The material state of matter will indicate how mobile that material may become, can help determine if there will be far-reaching hazardous properties. Know that awareness of hazardous material mobility helps rescuers determine the control zones and the evacuation distance. Know that your emergency response guidebook, and make sure you know this, your emergency response guidebook establishes separate isolation, initial isolation distances based on involved product state of matter. So you need to know solid 75 feet, liquids 150 feet, gas 330 feet. Make sure you know that. Know that when it comes to mobility, solids are least mobile and gases have the greatest mobility. Make sure you remember that. Liquids may be mobile depending on the property, uh, the properties of the substance. The substance state may change if the temperature changes. Know that. Solids may change to a liquid if the temperature increases. Consider the temperature's effect on a substance if the incident is located outside because air temperature and weather factors can strongly influence a substance state of matter and its behavior. <clears throat> a gaseous hazard. A hazard. Before we get there, turn your page, go to 1054. I want you to look up at the top on figure uh, 24.8. You need to know as temperatures go up, the pressures go up. Make sure you know that. And as the temperatures come down, the pressures come down. That's why we cool tanks. So make sure that's something that you mark. Um, Incidents involving gas or gases are potentially the most dangerous. Know that. Many hazmat related injuries are due to inhalation of vapors or gases. Make sure you know that. Gaseous materials could have many variables and hazards such as they may have an odor, may be colorless or odorless, and tasteless. They may be separately or any combination of toxins, corrosives, or flammability. May have high pressure in excess of 15,000 PSI. May be extremely cold upon release and may have large expansion ratio if liquefied. We do need to know that gases have an un, uh, undefined shape 
and volume and keep expanding if uncontained. So make sure you know undefined shape. As a result, it is difficult to detect where they are, where they are not, and where they may be going. A gas leak in a building has potential directions to spread. Depending on ventilation and other factors, gas may spread throughout the building, to other buildings, through access shafts, and to the soil, and into the street where it will drift wherever the wind may take it. Gases are difficult, if not impossible, to contain for mitigation purposes. Compressed gases and liquefied gases expand rapidly when released, potentially threatening large areas. If a gas is invisible or has little or no odor, it may be impossible to detect without specialized detection equipment. Know that. Invisible or no odor, you will need specialized equipment to detect it. Materials kept under pressure and or temperatures higher than ambient conditions may change the state upon release. The ratio that gas will expand from its liquid state is a significant factor in mitigating a hazardous a hazmat incident involving materials under specific conditions. Know also this, expanding gases can displace oxygen. And if you're displacing oxygen, you're actually creating an asphyxiating atmosphere. And remember that term asphyxiation means suffocation. That means displacing the oxygen, you can't breathe. If a hazardous material is a gas, it will be present in the air and will, be, and will present a breathing and an insulation hazard. Make sure you know that. Some gases may present a contact hazard. In general, if an incident involves a gas, it has the potential to become a harder to mitigate, affect larger areas than incidents involving other states of matter. So just backing up one second, just make sure that you have this. <clears throat> when we're talking about compressed gases, just remember materials kept under pressure and or temperature higher or lower than ambient conditions may change the state upon release. Make sure you know that. And that is compressed gas. Materials under pressure, compressed gas. <clears throat> also on page 1056, there's a little warning and that's just basically what I read. Uh, about the asphyxiating atmosphere. Make sure you put a little check next to that and read over that. Liquid hazmat. Usually visible, even if the vapors are not, so it may be easier to detect their presence and determine the hazard area. Typically do not travel as far as gases unless they spill into a path or channel such as a storm drain stream, river, or other waterways. Responders may be able to predict their paths that spilled liquids will most likely follow. Will flow or pool according to the surface contours and topography, permitting opportunities for containment or confinement. Now remember we talk about containment and confinement, two different terms. Containment is keeping it in a container, usually more of a technician uh, that may be plugging, patching, those sort of things. So just remember, containment, container. Confinement means keeping it in an area. That might be a defensive measure. Taking some kitty litter, pouring around a liquid. You're, con you're confining it to an area. So make sure you know those two terms because you will see them again. Could present a splash or contact hazard. May pose a unique challenges to responders because they may take on the additional characteristics of a gas by emitting vapors. So liquids do emit vapors that could become an inhalation hazard. Conversion of a liquid to a vapor increases hazardous material mobility and challenges responders face when dealing with the material. Make sure you know that. Vapors, uh, vapors uh, from a liquid may travel much like gases, although typically not as far from their source, be much more difficult to detect than the liquid itself. 
be cautious and alert to vapors from liquids as they may contact uh, hazards, inhalation hazards, flammability, corrosive, and toxins. Solid, solid hazmat. Know that this is the least mobile, typically will remain in place unless acted upon by an exterior force such as wind, water, or gravity. Particle size or of solids such as dust, fumes, or powders may influence their behavior. Larger particles will probably settle out of the air fairly quickly. Smaller particles may remain suspended longer and travel further than larger particles. Know this, know what a micron is. A micron is a unit of measure typically used to express particle size. Make sure you know that. Solids may have dangerous properties, inhalation or contact hazards, small combustible particles that if ignited may explode, entrapment hazards in the form of the loose solid confined to large containers, anything from flammable, reactive, radioactive, corrosive. You can usually detect a solid visually, know that, visually, unless it has a microscopic particle. Visibility makes detecting the presence of solids easier than detecting gases or vapors from a liquid. Solids may sublimate, which is transition directly from a solid to a gas. Make sure you know that term. You will see that again. Dry ice or elemental uh, iodine uh, sublimating materials present the same hazards and concerns as liquids that emit vapors. With some exceptions, incidents involving solid materials are confined to limited areas with less likelihood of detecting travel. Solid incidents may require less complicated mitigation than protective actions than gases and liquids. This response depends on the chemical and physical properties of the material involved. Physical properties. A lot of these terms, I'm, I'm not going to read every bit of this. I'm going to go over these terms and it's going to be up to you to read over them. You will need to know these terms. I promise you, you will see them again. Uh, and not just on our test, but uh, you're going to see these on state exams also. Physical properties, characteristics of a material that do not involve the chemistry or chemical nature of the material. Describe how material behaves in relation to physical influences such as temperature and pressure or how material behaves when mixed with or compared to other material. Materials can be characterized by the following physical properties. And I'm going to start off with vapor pressure. It is a term you must know. Know this, vapor pressure is the presence, is the pressure exerted by a saturated vapor above its own liquid in a closed container. Make sure you know that term. The higher the temperature of a substance, the higher its vapor pressure will be. We talk about atmospheric pressure. That is 14.7. 14.7 is atmospheric pressure. The lower the boiling point of the temperature at which a liquid turns to a gas of a material, the higher the vapor pressure will be. If a material has a low boiling point, it requires less heat to change from a liquid to a gas. Know that. Know that water requires a lot of heat to boil, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Know that. Boiling point. Now I'm just hitting some highlights of this, but just, it's going to be up to you. You're going to have to read through this a little bit more. Boiling point. Know this term. It is the temperature at which a liquid changes to a gas at a given pressure. I want you to add this. Add a low boiling point will move more readily and change to a vapor than a liquid with a high boiling point. I'll read it again. A low boiling point will move more readily, change to a vapor, than a liquid with a high boiling point. Make sure you know that. And write it down. Let's talk about a 
Um, Boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, also known as a blevy. Boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, blevy, B-L-E-V-E. -E. This is also called a violent rupture. This can occur when a liquid within a container is heated, causing the material inside to boil or vaporize. In such case of a liquid petroleum gas tank exposed to a fire, if the resulting increase in the internal vapor pressure exceeds the vessel's ability to relieve or retain that excessive pressure, the container will fail. As the vapor is released, it expands rapidly and ignites, sending flames and pieces of tank flying in all directions. Blevies are most commonly occur when flames contact a shell above the liquid level or when insufficient water is applied to keep a, a tank shell cool. You need to know every bit of that about a blevy. So make sure you read that. <clears throat> That's on page 1060. So, heated liquid or gas expanding, and that is where you deal with a blevy. Make sure you read that entire top paragraph on 1060. Sublimation, melting point, freezing point, sublimation. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier. Know this, this is a solid to a gas, a solid to a gas. Make sure melting point, temperature, which a solid substance <clears throat> changes to a liquid state at normal atmospheric pressure. At normal atmospheric pressure, again, is 14.7. Freezing point, temperature, which a liquid becomes a solid at normal atmospheric pressure. So, an ice cube melts just above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure you understand that uh, term, sublimation, and that some su substances changing directly from a solid into a gas. Substance changing directly from a solid to a gas. Make sure you know that, solid to a gas. Vapor density. We went over this term before, you should already know this. Weight of a given volume of pure vapor or gas compared to the weight of an equal volume of dry air at the same temperature and pressure. Know that term. Vapor density. Less than one, the vapor is lighter than air. Greater than one, vapor is heavier than air. When lighter than air, gases and vapors will rise. Heavier than air, gases and vapors will sink. Make sure you know that. Okay, uh, there's a note on 1060 uh, on vapor density. Read over that note. All vapors and gases will mix with air, but the lighter materials and less confined tend to rise and dissipate. Make sure you know that. Okay, solubility, miscibility, solubility in water. Make sure you know that this is percentage of the material by weight that will dissolve in water at ambient temperature. Affects whether the substance mixes in water. Solubility information can be useful in determining spill cleanup methods and extinguishing agents. Let's just, I'm going to read over this real quick. When a non-water soluble liquid, such as a hydrocarbon, a hydrocarbon is something you should have went over in foam operations. Hydrocarbons, gasoline, diesel fuel, those things, when combined with water, the two liquids remain separated. So most hydrocarbons float on water. When a water-soluble li liquid such as a polar solvent, a polar solvent is alcohol, methanol, those things combine with water and mix with water. So just know that hydrocarbons mostly float on water. That is going to be some sort of petroleum-based product versus a polar solvent, which is an alcohol-type product, and that is going to mix with water. That determines what sort of foam you need. Remember your 3%, 6%? Depends on if it's a hydrocarbon or a polar solvent.
let's uh, irritant agents. Irritant agents that are water soluble usually cause early resp upper respiratory tract infection, resulting in coughing and throat irritation. I just want to read this to you real quick. Partially water soluble chemicals will penetrate into the lower respiratory system and cause delayed symptoms that include breathing difficulties, pulmonary edema, and maybe coughing up blood. Make sure you understand those two, irritant agents and partially water-soluble chemicals. Make sure you know that and read over that. Miscibility, ability of two or more gases or liquids to mix with or to dissolve into each other. Know that term. Two liquids or gases are mix, uh, mix, uh, miscible if they mix or dissolve into each other in any proportion. Immiscibility, uh, materials that do not readily dissolve into each other. So make sure you know the difference in those two. Specific gravity, ratio of density of a material to the density of a standard material, usually an equal volume of water. Remember vapor density, we're dealing with some sort of gas or vapor. Now we're dealing with a liquid. Specific gravity is a liquid, the weight of a liquid. Example, if a volume of a material weighs 8 pounds and equal volume of water weighs 10 pounds, the material is said to have a specific gravity of 0.8. So know this. Materials with a specific gravity less than 1 will float on water. Know that. Materials with a specific gravity greater than one will sink in water. Solubility plays an important role in specific gravity. Most, but not all, flammable liquids have a specific gravity less than one and will float on water. That is an important consideration for fire suppression activities. Persistence and viscosity. Persistence. Know this. Ability to remain in the environment. That is the key to that. Remains is persistent. It remains in the environment. Chemicals that remain in the environment for a long time are more persistent than chemicals that, chemicals that quickly dissipate or break down. Persistent nerve agents will remain affected at their point of dispersion for a much longer time than a non-persistent nerve agent. Viscosity. Know this. Viscosity is a measure of the thickness of a liquid at a given temperature. So now we're measuring the thickness, viscosity. Know that term. Viscosity determines the ease at which a product will flow. I'll just give you an example. Uh, water versus molasses. The viscosity of water versus molasses. Water is going to flow faster than molasses, which is thicker. I'm going to move on to appearance and odor. Appearance and odor. Safety data sheet. This is something we're going to get into a little bit later, also known as the SDS. Safety data sheets were also called and still are called MSDS, which is material safety data sheets. So know that. So next to safety data sheet, also write MSDS. You might see it as MSDS. Typically contains a description of the material's appearance and odor. Appearance may help you detect a substance or material. That helps you evaluate a change in appearance, which may indicate a change in the behavior of that substance. For many industrial products, the color listed on the SDS may represent an average, and the product ship may vary significantly in color and still be the same product. Odor, that could indicate that the responders are too close. Some chemicals have little or no odor. Other chemicals have a very strong odor. The smell of natural gas. Natural gas has no odor. What is added, know this, is mercaptan. Mercaptan is added and that gives it the rotten egg smell. 
mercaptan is added to natural gas to give it the rotten egg smell. Otherwise, in its natural form, it is odorless. The ability to smell or sense an odor is highly dependent on the individual. We need to know this, odor threshold. Odor threshold, no, it is the concentration in air at which the average person can smell a particular compound. Some people can smell a given compound at an extremely low level. Other people may not be able to smell a particular compound even at a very high concentrations in the air. Never use odors to determine safe or unsafe areas. Some highly toxic products may cause significant damage at a concentration below the odor threshold. So make sure you know that. Chemical properties. Well, you know what? We're close to my 30 minute mark. And we haven't really even scratched the surface yet. So let me go ahead. I'm going to stop this, make this part two, and we'll get started on chemical properties.